Welcome to the Disorient Asian American Film Festival of Oregon. My name is Pamela Kwan and I'm the executive director. Chinese immigrants have lived and contributed to the U.S. for about 200 years. In the 1860s, approximately 12,000 Chinese men worked on the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, yet we hear so little about them. They formed communities while they worked, not because they set out to live separately, but because they were not allowed to live in established towns. Hence, the origins of the oldest Chinatown communities were formed through the encouraged migration of laborers from China. We have the pleasure of speaking with two filmmakers who have documented historical and contemporary Chinese American communities. It's my honor to introduce the director of the feature documentary, Celestials, Barry Fong. Hello, Pam. Hey Hi, thank you for being here. Thank you. Let's all, yeah. Let's also welcome the director of the short doc, Our Chinatown, Red Gaskell. Hey, Hi, Red. how's it going? Hey, good, thanks. And I think we're going to have a fun discussion today. We have a lot of interesting topics to uncover. Let's get started. First, can you tell us a little bit about your film and how you got involved with the project? Uh, let's start with Barry. Great. So Celestials is actually the culmination of about seven years of work. And it was all actually initiated by um, Stanford University's um, Chinese Railroad Worker in North America project which was a, an academic uh, uh, you know, mission that was started by Professor Gordon Chang. And, and his goal was to kind of create the definitive volume about um, Chinese uh, railroad workers in the, in the United States. So I was brought in in the very beginning to, to interview um, uh, descendants of railroad workers. And that turned into you know, a few different other, other things that you'll see in the film and we can talk about later. Uh, but but basically the film traces this you know seven year project with I think over a hundred scholars about a million dollars worth of uh, research money. Wow, seven years, that's incredible. Uh, Red, let's hear from you. Uh, yeah, so your mm -hmm. uh, the the genesis of of the project really was I was living in New York at the time and uh, we had just gone through the first year of the pandemic. And um, I had known the community was hurting. And um, the one of my uh, colleagues, Nick, he worked at this company called Square and we had wanted to work together on something. And he reached out about uh, working on a, a project for Asian Pacific Islander uh, History Month. Um, and we kind of brainstormed for a bit and thought about like how we could make something that supports the businesses in Chinatown. And that's kind of the, gen that's basically how it all started. And we kind of went from there. My gosh. And then yeah. amazing things happened from there. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Barry, I was fascinated uh, by the archeological dig in Changdong, China. What was it like being on site? Yeah, so that that um, you know that was the that was five trips I think we took to China, and because they're the archaeologists work on their non on the, on an academic schedule, so they're kind of digging during the the off times. So I think for five years we uh, you know spent the winter in China, spent the ho uh, holidays in China, uh, and it was an incredible experience. I you know traveled to China several several times, but I got a view of the of the country in a way that most. Americans don't get to see the country. It is um, it is massive and diverse, and I think most people in the West don't understand that. Um, it is deeply, deeply rooted. I mean, these are families that understand their history for two thousand plus years. They can trace back every generation and every person in their family, and so uh, that is it's a big contrast to um, being in the West. Uh, food is incredible. People were <laughs> incredible. <laughs> food was maybe some of the best food I've ever had in my life. Wow. Uh, it's, you know, uh, a farm to table, but, you know, they've been doing it for, for a few thousand years. And wow. um, yeah, the people were generous and kind and, and um, archaeology is kind of intrusive. I mean, there are people in your village 12 hours of, of the day making noise and digging holes. And they were just so interested in what we were doing, so fascinated and so helpful. Great. 
Wow. And they unearthed some really surprising artifacts and, and conclusions. Um, did you sh get to shoot on any of the archaeological sites on the United States side? Um, no, we didn't get to do that. But mm -hmm. uh, I think that is that is, you know, something that we need to do in the future because of this. And what you mentioned is the, the most fascinating thing to me was this two way relationship between during that period. So it wasn't just labor coming from China to the US. It was labor and information and technology going that way and also returning, right? So we were, the China was bringing back in, as you see in the film, uh, for those of you who have seen it, uh, you know, medicines and uh, construction techniques and architectural styles. That was all coming back into China from the West. So that is very evident, one, evident once you're there. Uh, in China, looking at things and, and looking at buildings and uh, looking at how they're built and how they're styled. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't go there, you probably could, you know, you, know, you could overlook that, that that was that two-way relationship. Exactly. That was shocking news. I don't think uh, many people understand, you know, you think it was a locked, closed country. Um, it was exciting to see experts in a variety of fields contributing to the project. Um, you had historians, you worked with archaeologists, architects, folklorists, and you know, and you as filmmaker. Did the team and the and you know the larger team have a lab set up on site? Do you have spaces to work in? Yeah, absolutely. So that uh, Chandung village is a a traditional village, and they are. Um, there is an effort led by Wu Yi University and Professor, Professor Celia Tan, who you see in the film, mm -hmm. to um, conserve that village. So they have been one by one um, restoring the buildings, reinforcing these uh, brick buildings with steel and adding you know, plumbing, air conditioning, electricity so that uh, people can use them. And they're, mm -hmm. they've been using the village for uh, a, kind of a little bit like a tourist site, but also just for people in the area to continue to be able to use these buildings as resources for meetings and for family gatherings and for celebrations. So they did, uh, Chandung set up a couple different labs and offices for us. Um, you know, a couple of rooms had bunk beds that you could take a nap in. Uh, why, you know, it's kind of amazing to be in this village that feels ancient, but they had Wi-Fi that worked almost right. everywhere in the village. Exactly. <laughs> Actually pretty fast Wi-Fi. That's yep. crazy. Yeah. And, that was uh, good. Actually, at one point, the uh, I broke my shoe, and um, one of the villagers said, "Oh, we can order it." So she takes her phone out and she starts typing on her phone, and it's you know uh, Alibaba or whatever, and oh she gosh. shows me these shoes, and she goes, "Okay, um, yeah, I ordered it." You know, and I said, <laughs> "Okay, I'm thinking it'll take five days to get out to this remote village, but uh -huh. I'm not joking. Under 24 hours, this van oh pulls gosh. up into the village. <laughs> the guy steps out, hands me a box of shoes." Oh and, and takes off. So, um, you know, in a way, it seems it seems uh, you know primitive, but uh, mm -hmm. they are living in the modern world. Certainly are. It's like the DoorDash of shoes. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> or probably anything you want. Yes, anything you want for sure. So, are the are the archaeologists allowed to take the artifacts out of China? Are they allowed? They, do they just have permission to study them and they stay in China? That's, a, that's a, a great question and really something that the team wrestled with for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, we, we were not, we are not, we're not and are not allowed to take anything out of China. I that was something that, yes. that the, the government was very uh, cautious about that they did not want anything removed. Um, mm -hmm. It's pretty unlikely that we would have found something that would be, that was extremely valuable, uh, you know, rare coins or artifacts. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, we did find lots of evidence uh, pre-cultural revolution and they just didn't want those. They just didn't want those things out. So what we did um, in that lab that that was set up is uh, measuring things that were significant. They have a whole system. Archaeologists have a whole system of measuring, photographing, recording, and cataloging. So they, you know, came back with these big folders or binders full of data and thousands of photographs, and uh, and then were able to, uh, you know, analyze them when they came back here. And there have been subsequent trips to go look at the collection as well, uh, because they, they're actually all stored in, in, uh, in an incredible facility that they have in China, actually. Well, that's that's great, because uh, there was a lot of work that went into that. Um, hopefully you'll get, like you said, you'll be able to get to do some filming on the archaeological sites on the U.S. side. It was really cool to see representation from Oregon with the Southern Oregon University researcher. 
Absolutely. Yeah. If you, if you have a chance look up Chelsea Rose um, okay. at SOU and she, she has done some incredible research up there. And I was supposed to go there in 20, 2020 to work with her and, and video and, and uh -huh. record, but uh, you know, pandemic stopped all of that. So hopefully we can do that sooner in the future. But, right. Um, you know, she was certainly one of the keys to making the connections between, um, you know, the material artifacts in the, in the, here found here in the West and in China. Right. Will you visit Chelsea and then come up to Disorient? Oh, for sure. Yeah. You. <laughs> you know, after working on the railroads, some, um, some of the workers went back to China and um, you showed that some stayed and made a life. It was so natural after being exposed to New World that you would see a flow of goods and services between the U.S. and China. It makes sense. Um, it was mentioned that some were, you know, some of the workers were observed reading. So some had, you know, some level of education. What did you think about the entrepreneurs that came after the railroad was built? Yeah, I think that's that's actually one of the most in interesting interesting things about the oral histories is um, hearing about what their li lives were like for the people that stayed. And it, it really fits in well with Red's film and uh, about Chinatown because, you know, that was the center of survival. And um, yeah, um, sorry, remind me of the. Of the oh, just again. the entrepreneurs. What did you oh, know? What, sure. what were your thoughts about, you know? Yes. What you know, like it's kind of the challenges, but also the excitement, you know, because they could, I'm sure they were inspired once they were exposed to all these new things. Yeah. So I think what you would find if you spent, uh, you know, five or six months in that part of China um, is that everybody there is an entrepreneur. They are, <laughs> you know, they are the inventors of the side hustle, right? So they're working a job, but they're coming home, they're raising fish in the pond, they've got chickens in the backyard, they've got vegetables all over in every square inch of dirt that you can find. Uh, they are driving people for a few dollars. You know, they're, you know, the internet certainly changed that. There were people in the village, uh, young people that were tr using their cars for uh, their version of Uber uh, uh -huh. and driving people around. And so they're, you know, it's, it's side hustles everywhere uh -huh. and also multiple skills everywhere. everywhere. So you uh -huh. see people that could do um, construction, cooking, uh, make art, uh, right. I mean, you just, you just see it everywhere and, you know, they're not all masters, but they certainly can do many things, probably a lot like any, any another, any country community here in the United States. There are people that can fix their tractor as well as, you know, read and write poetry. So, um, so I, I think that was very natural for, for entrepreneurship to bloom here uh, because there were opportunities. Right. But also, I think there was a survival, survival uh, need for survival, right? And they were, they were, you know, the side hustle. They were trying to do everything they could. And that was my grandparents' story too. That they, mm -hmm. they took every chance they could. They took every opportunity they could to survive. Right. I, I mean, how, how intense it must have been to see it in the people in Wu Yi and Changdong but also know as you're tracking the, the history that the researchers are recounting and, and you know, providing evidence of that it's, it's in the people. You know, these are the people right. who came. This is what the skills and resources they had. So wonderful. Um, you also interviewed a few descendants, quite a few actually descendants of Chinese railroad workers. And, and you included two noted authors, Lisa C. and Maxine Hong Kingston. How did you connect with all of these descendants? Yeah, so that was, uh, that was part of why this took seven years because there's just not a good, not a glossary or catalog of all these people. So we, you know, started by uh, a couple people coming forward and being interviewed and, 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 and then uh, us asking them, do you know any other descendants? And we would just, it was just word of mouth and networking. Oh. And, uh, and, it, and it really was over seven years that we found, we probably found about 70 descendants that had, um, well, we probably found about 150 people that came forward. Um, about 70 of them had verifiable stories that their families actually, uh, did, you know, um, ancestors actually did work on the railroad. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the people we interviewed. Uh -huh. um, yeah, totally, wow. totally fascinating. I know. And it was remarkable that some of the some of the ancestors, act, I mean, um, descendants actually retained keepsakes from their ancestors um, that really connect them 
um, concretely to the building of the railroad. That was incredible that you had that yeah, in your film. Absolutely. So that, you know, that is part of the digging. So we, what we noticed about halfway through was that a lot of the oral history repeated itself. So there were, I mean, many families had the same experiences. They kind of arrived in San Francisco. They went to Sacramento. They worked on the railroad as a laborer. Then there weren't, there wasn't much detail after that. So the really exciting ones, and there were very few, of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cases, uh, Gino Chan in Sacramento had, had actual documents and payroll records. And mm -hmm. we found, uh, you know, artifacts from the train. And so those are really, really exciting to find after, after, you know, so many years of kind of networking and trying to find these people. Definitely. You know, one of the most interesting people you interviewed was Philip Choi with the Chinese Historical Society of America in San Francisco. Uh, what were some of the functions of this organization? So Chinese Historical so Society was actually, is actually also a partner in this film. I should make sure I mention them. Oh, great. Um, yeah. And so CHSA, uh, you know, had its roots in the civil rights movement and they they were sort of you know, really riding on the coattails of the African-American civil rights movement. And they were seeing changes and they were saying, we need to sort of get in on this and at the same time, you know, participate, but also record because they felt they could feel the shift, right? The, the huge tectonic plates shifting um, in terms of how they were going to be treated in the United States. So, uh, but, and so Phil was really in, at the heart of that, right? He was an early activist, a very vocal, um, I, t I always say he's a tiger, but he's a, also a kitten, right? He's a really gentle, sweet guy, but, but could fight, you know, and really mm -hmm. argue when he needed to and, and fight for people's rights. Mm -hmm. And so CHSA has continued on that mission. They still exist now down in Chinatown. They have a museum that they're about to open up a Bruce Lee exhibit. Um, and they have all, you know, I think continued to be uh, active participants in activism. And mm -hmm. uh, as well as active participants in recording and continue, continuing to record, uh, you know, Asian American, Chinese American history. I am just so grateful that they preserve the history of Chinese Americans because no one else was doing it. You know, this would all be lost. Um, yeah, Philip Choi and the Chinese Historical Society, they're heroes in my book. Um, this is the beauty of having a Chinatown, right, Red? I mean, that sense of looking out for one another is at the core of Chinatowns. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and um, we, will, we will talk more about that when we get to your film. Uh, I, I think one of the stories that was new to me was that um, the blatant disrespect shown to Philip Choi during the Golden Spike Centennial Celebration in Promontory, Utah. Um, it looked like, I'm not sure if I caught this right, but it looked like you might have shown a quick glimpse of a small news article about the missed acknowledgement. Did I see that? Yeah, that's correct. So the, the Chronicle did, uh, SF Chronicle did uh, recognize that, there, that, you know, there was a little bit of a, a, a snub there, mm -hmm. uh, but it went away very quickly. And mm -hmm. uh, of it, course. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it infuriated the Chinese American community, um, mm -hmm. you know, especially here in San Francisco with this, with CHSA here. And um, I don't think the sting ever left Phil, you know, you see, yeah. I don't want to give too much away, but, you know, in the yeah. interview, you see that it, he still, he still feels it. He still felt yeah. it after all those years. I and I really think, I don't want to spoil too much uh, uh -huh. for those who, who haven't seen the film, but uh -huh. that is the whole arc, which is, you know, people of color, color in this country trying to gain recognition, trying to be recognized from the, for the contributions that they made mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. the development of the country, development of the West, development of California. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, maybe in a little, in a small part, the railroad um, story is, a, is one what, which will help people understand that struggle and, mm -hmm. uh, and help people understand why recognition is important. Exactly. I, I thought you ended so strong with Kenny, uh, with Connie Young, uh, Young Yu. Um, she spoke up uh, very loudly, um, and I don't want to give too much away either. But um, you just did a phenomenal job ending with her, and um, she's awesome. And um, you know, I think one of the one of the things that could have happened is she could have said what was expected and kept it at that. Um, 
but she took the moment and I think represented what we all felt. So, um, you know, if you haven't seen the film, you got to watch it. So, and yeah, I, I'll just add one thing in there, which I hope won't yeah. spoil it. But, yeah. uh, you know, Connie invited me to record that. And I sort of thought, eh, I don't, it's Utah. I don't know how many people will care, but yeah. you'll see, you'll see there were 10,000 plus people there. And I, the video quality is not very good because I assumed I'd be, the, you know, one of the few people there yeah. recording, but. I was pushed so far back because of the crowd yeah. and the crowd was, you know, very white, very, mm -hmm. you know, what you would see, look at visually is very, what we, you know, call now conservative. Uh -huh. But as she was speaking, I could hear people in the crowd saying, yeah, right on. You know, like she's like, <laughs> immigrants build America. And she's like, people are like, yeah, all right. You're right. And, and I was, I was in chills. I still get chills thinking about it now because right. it was just such a powerful moment. I mean, she had so much courage. So that was, that was a moment. Yeah, it's great. Well, well done, Barry. Thank you so much. Thank and you thank you to you and the audience for uh, screening the film. Sure. So Red, I love to talk with you about your film. Your film is on New York Chinatown, which mm -hmm. um, took a brutal hit on a couple of fronts when the pandemic hit. Why was that? Um, I think, you know, really before uh, COVID made national news, it was a New York story. It was happening mm -hmm. in New York. And um, th that was where it was hit the hardest. But there was also news about, you know, the virus coming out of China. And so immediately there was this fear of Asian Americans and Chinese people specifically. I, mm -hmm. you know, I have my DP who on the film, he told me stories about people on the seven train who were Chinese that he knew that were being sprayed with Lysol because people were afraid of Chinese people. Uh -huh. So uh, I think that was kind of the immediate, like, I don't want to use the word like, target, but like people uh -huh. fixated on Chinatown. I was like, okay, we, we shouldn't go there because that's where we'll most likely get maybe potentially this virus that everyone, the whole world was panicking and shutting down over. Exactly. I mean, it was so devastating also for the business owners because public gatherings and businesses mm -hmm. had to close. So their source of income, not only did they, were they personally attacked for what they looked like, which, you know, there was no basis for that. Um, it, it was like the racism that was rampant in the 1860s was back. Mm -hmm. And, um, what other experiences did you hear about and witness um, with the business community in Chinatown? Uh, it was just, you know, New York is a very dense place and mm -hmm. there's people walking all the time. The streets are just filled mm -hmm. with people. So it just immediately was like a ghost town. It was eerie. Mm -hmm. Like you never mm -hmm. see the streets that empty with doors shuttered, even mm -hmm. on like a slow day. There's people on the weekdays, it's the locals are there. And then on the weekends, there's tourists there. So for there to be no one there was just shocking. Right. Yeah. Um, and you talked with, I mean, you, um, you covered so much in your film um, in such a short amount of time. I'm sure you probably interviewed other businesses and, you know, kind of whittled it down. What what other types of businesses are there in Chinatown? Just for, we don't have a Chinatown here in Oregon. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, for people who don't have that luxury yeah. of knowing so what that's like. What I really love about Chinatown is you can get everything there. You could, you don't have to leave Chinatown. So there's mm -hmm. furniture stores, there's antique stores. You could go to your doctor, your eye doctor. I love it because they're not closed on the weekends. They're open on Sunday. I, I, I could, they are. <laughs> yeah. so it's one of those things where it's like, you're working all week and all, you know, I can only go to places on the weekend and it's like, yeah, I can still make an appointment. It's great. Uh, all sorts of restaurants, um, produce, like honestly the best tasting fruits and vegetables come from Chinatown. Uh, and there's so many different street vendors as well. It's, it's honestly like, you can, anything you need is probably within a two block distance. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, and then when the pandemic hit, just streets were empty and things, no people walking around. Yeah. Streets were empty. No people were walking around. There's, um, there's also another organization I want to uh, talk about called uh -huh. uh, Heart of Dinner. And uh -huh. there were a lot of elderly, because the 
community in Chinatown is aging, and there are a lot of elderly Chinese folks who would go to these recreation centers and things to socialize and have a meal, but they were shut down. So what they did was they started, um, they originally were working, a couple of folks were working in a restaurant, but they were taking food donations, buying food and preparing meals and delivering them with handwritten notes in Chinese, because uh-huh. a lot of the meal services that were being provided had a lot of dairy or things that like Asian Americans can't eat. So mm-hmm. they were preparing food that was more familiar and like part of their diet and also kind of closing that social isolation gap. So I thought that was, that was a really beautiful thing, but um, we were, for this documentary, we were focused on multi-generational businesses. So this was kind of a new business. So we didn't include them in this documentary. Right. Yeah. That was another a part of your documentary that I thought was interesting because um, we people have been talking about how Chinatowns are facing so many challenges. But you happen to pick businesses where second, third, fourth generation um, uh, descendants are coming back and keeping the businesses alive. And that's that's not happening everywhere. So it's nice to see um, one of the ones that you um visited was a tea shop and I love that shot of the like the discs of tea the packages Mm -hmm. of tea along the wall Uh, that's like so Chinese and it was beautiful so uh well at the end of your film I saw a a frame and you referenced a website it said it said uh send Chinatown love can you tell us about that yeah uh yeah I'm wearing the t-shirt right now um (laughs) yeah so they are an organization that kind of they're offering it's all volunteer based and what they're doing is um helping businesses in Chinatown modernize their businesses because many of them are cash only and they have a lot of systems that are kind of in the you know old school like the beginning Mm -hmm. of Chinatown world and Mm -hmm. what uh they're doing this is these are all like knowledge workers who have like tech jobs and things like that, they're giving them the tools to have like an e-commerce business or like set up a website and kind of grow their revenue beyond just the streets of Chinatown. So it it was really cool because the, um, the, the company behind producing this film square, um, one of the founders of send Chinatown love is an engineer there. And we had found out that he was behind it because as we were interviewing different businesses, we, we saw that they were all connected to this single square account called Under Send Chinatown Love. They're all linked, about 70 of them. We're like, wait, how is this happening? And yeah. uh, then um, my contacts at Square, they you know circled back with the, engine, with the team who, was, who set it up. And we found out it was just like this amazing coincidence, really. Wow. I mean, people yeah. just sharing their skills to help others. It's just, Mm -hmm. you're sharing a beautiful message of hope in your film. And it's a testament to the potential that we all have for goodness. So thank you for doing a wonderful job. Thank you. It was an honor. Yeah. Um, So everyone check it out. The website is sendchinatownlove.com. So now I'd love to to find out from both Barry and Red if you have any projects in the pipeline. We'd love to hear about them. What you got going on, Barry? Um, so I did make a film over the pandemic called Sunzai, which is about uh, the, the Japan town that existed in Santa Barbara, in actually the most expensive part of downtown Santa Barbara, and it was uh, raised, you know, uh, after after the uh, internment. Uh, most of the population left and the block was raised. And, uh, and so it was, actually, it's actually another archeology span project and with oral history of uh, people that lived in the neighborhood. And so that, um, you know, the past 20 months have been pretty rough on, on for filmmakers. Uh-huh. But, um, I will start that process of getting them into uh, festivals, getting that film into festivals and, and touring it around and hopefully we get that onto it's, it's an educational film like celestials as i think it, it belongs in the educational sphere wonderful well keep us posted on that great, great. and red what projects are you working on yeah so i've you know just 
there's some freelance stuff just to, you know, to kind of pay the bills. But uh, uh, personally, I've been researching more about um, my Filipino history in America. And uh, the one thing that's been really intriguing is uh, Louisiana and how uh, Filipinos came here around the 1500s and then oh. you know, set up because of the Spanish and then set up in Louisiana and kind of help the locals set up the shrimping industry. And there's a really great series out right now on HBO called Takeout. Takeout. And the first mm-hmm. episode kind of dives into that a bit. And I've been doing my own sort of research for the past year. And to see that, I was like, oh, wow, there's an appetite for this. This is this is really cool to see. So yeah. I'm trying to figure out whether I uh, create more of a documentary or like a fictionalized sort of short series based on like, what could have happened around that time because the the town actually doesn't exist anymore it was wiped away by hurricanes but Mm -hmm. um there are some descendants from those first uh folks who arrived so that's just something on the back burner well that sounds so cool and red has another film in the disorient 2022 program and you know you get to touch on some filipino american culture well north american culture there so um yeah so make sure you check out dear dad yeah yes that's it yeah, so check that out. Well, in wrapping, I want to say it's really important to understand the history that we learned from Barry's film, Celestials. Uh, there are valuable lessons and extraordinary accomplishments of our predecessors that deserve to be recognized and honored. You know, when we know the strength of the people who came before us, we can be that for the people who come after us, as demonstrated by Red's film, Our Chinatown. Um, thank you so much both for joining us. And I want to say, audiences, don't forget to rate the films after you watch them because they're eligible for an Audience Choice Award. And again, thank you both for making time to share more information about your films and about you as filmmakers. It's given us uh, at Disorient a better appreciation for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you.